um, good morning I want to focus on uh, one more aspect that I have to cover before I end over to Dr. Kumalo um, so far what we have done is to show you how you go about estimating a linear regression model within a bivariate context and I am convinced that you are now comfortable with that process um, we've looked at the assumptions that underpin the theory of classical linear regression model and we showed at least in the case of the normality assumption that if it breaks down several of the hypothesis testing procedures that we use also break down because they all are built or founded on the assumption of normality of the residuals now we want to look at other violations besides the violation of the normality assumption um, these violations focus on the behavior of the error term uh, this is your chapter 11 and 12 of Gujarati I'm, I'm discussing these in the bivariate context Dr. Kumalo will take you into the mod variate context and discuss these again in detail so you will have the benefit of a repetition of the concepts but within different contexts and now <coughs> There were five assumptions that related to the error term. The first of which was that the error term is normally distributed with a mean of zero and a constant variance. Um, the second of which was that the error term has a constant variance. That is, it is a homo sidastic. Homo meaning uniform, um, sidastic referring to spread. So it, there is a uniform spread, uniform variation, constant variance. Okay? But now, a hetero implies that it is changing from observation to observation. So, so as you move from observation to observation, your variance of the error term does not remain the same. That violation is very important because it has serious implications that can also confound our hypothesis testing procedures. And remember that homocytosticity is about minimum variance in the blue acronym, the B part of it, which is best, refers to the idea of minimum variance. Now, the moment we have this problem of heterocytosticity of the variance of the error term, what it implies, what it implies is that the variances of the estimators of our beaters generally become large and when they become large the tendency is that we will have very wide confidence intervals very small t observed which means in general we end up accepting false or failing to reject false now hypothesis which is committing type 2 error then autocorrelation relates to the third assumption which we also made this assumption is about the relationship between successive error terms so if successive error terms tend to have a systematic relationship there is a pattern there they tend to influence each other we say that we have a problem of autocorrelation uh, 
this is framed in the context of so in the context of time if you are working with time series data we call it serial correlation if you are working with cross-sectional data it's spatial correlation okay um so in the context of cross-sectional data it could be about catching up with the genesis and so forth all right so let's try to to move on um what we want to do in this section is to just ask the question what happens if some of these assumptions about the error term break down um will we still be able to continue with our analysis no so what i want you to do is to read pages 366 to 368 here you will have an explanation of the potential causes of a non constant variance the explanation there is not technical at all you can easily follow that uh, let me explain now <coughs> what happens to the variance of our beaters and in this context i focus only on the slope coefficient um it's more intuitive there okay so this is the variance of our slope coefficient under homocysticity you remember this right this is a constant variance it's a constant number but this one because it is an i okay so as you move from one observation to another your x is changing do you see that <coughs> right so so the ratio of these two numbers here gives us that variance now when we have a heterocytosticity The sigma squared here now has a subscript i, which means that as you move from one observation to the next up to the nth observation, it is changing. So this number here is also changing from, from one observation to another. This is also changing. So now the product of these two is changing from observation to another. And now there are two things that will happen if both are very large or if both are large then it means that you will have a very large variance if one of them is large one is small there is also a possibility that you end up having a large variance you see that now <clears throat> that in itself will lead to a number of problems okay and that's what we want to discuss now these are the consequences if we have this problem of heterocytosticity let's see i think i omitted a bracket here please um Okay, so there must be um, a bracket here. And the square there. Okay. Alright, let's move on. Um, what are the consequences? So if you have heterocytosticity, the in all likelihood you will have very wide confidence intervals because your standard errors will be big remember that you say um your b1 i take that to be the estimated uh, coefficient mm -hmm. plus t critical by uh, standard error of b1 so what we are saying is that if this number here is big 
okay because of this problem of hetero if this number here is big then you end up having a very wide confidence interval okay so this is plus or minus you very you will have a very wide confidence interval the acceptance region becomes large and therefore the likelihood of you failing to reject the null hypothesis is very high now but also remember the way you calculate your t is to say your b1 over the standard error of b1 okay now if b if the standard error of b1 is a very large number then this ratio tends to be very small so your t ops will be very small okay as a result you the tendency is to fail to reject the now hypothesis which is what we also see here then also the f becomes irrelevant and so forth so you must also read this section where he talks about consequences of um a heterocytosticity okay then what i want to do is to walk you through four more tests that you can use once you have estimated your regression how do you come to know that the assumption of homocytosticity has been violated or has not been violated and this requires you to carry out some tests um, the first one is the graphical method which i will not illustrate but it's simple you can if you if you sketch the square of your estimated residuals against your x variable which is education in the in our case here there are several things that can happen you might find a systematic pattern or you might not find a systematic pattern if you find a systematic pattern which could be linear which could be quadratic which could be just proportional linear proportional whatever whatever relationship you find as long as it is systematic then it means that the error variance actually is varying as your x variable changes from observation to observation and that would be a, a a, a, an intuitive indication of the presence of heterocytosticity but i will formally discuss these methods of uh, testing for heterocytosticity starting with the most restrictive one which is the pack test ending with the more general test which is able to discover more complex forms of heterocytosticity alongside functional misspecification so i will stop here